right. Um, you can hear me okay? So, um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Ken English, um, and uh, this deck is online. Actually, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, this deck's online. There's also um, a series of blog posts on my site that uh, go over the same material in, in more detail um, at zeroviscosity.com, or if you don't want to type, zevi.co takes you to the same place. Um, so we're going to be talking about D3. And for those who don't know D3, it stands for Data Driven Documents. And it's a really flexible and powerful library for manipulating SVG, HTML, and CSS. Um, the, the website has a pile of examples and very extensive documentation. And if you're not impressed with the examples on d3js.org, then you probably have suffered a brain injury recently, and you should see a doctor pretty soon, because um, it's really quite something. It was created by uh, Mike Bostock, who uh, I don't have a picture of him, but you can just imagine he looks something like this. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, an amazing developer. He works at the New York, New York Times. Um, all right, so what we're going to be doing is trying to simplify J or D3 a little bit for you, because it can be pretty daunting. The, the, um, there's, the API is very extensive. And when you first start looking at examples, you might think, holy crap, that's a lot of code needed to do anything at all. But um, uh, don't panic. It's going to be, it, we're going to take it step by step, and it's not going to be too bad. Um, so we're going to start out with a very, very basic pie chart. And we're going to add layers onto it until we have something like this that has tooltips and that I can filter and it animates when I filter it. Um, so. Let's get started, because there's a lot to cover. We're going to look at a pie chart, then turn it into a donut chart, add a legend, uh, load some external data, add the tooltips, and then finally add the, the filtering and the animations. So now I, there's probably a few data scientists in the crowd that are thinking, ooh, gross, you know, a pie chart, why would you do that? And because pie charts you know, are not the, the best for, just for uh, conveying information in a visual form. But uh, we're not concerned about that today. We just want to learn. D3, and for learning D3, the pie chart's actually one of the better, better ones to look at. Um, so if we take a look at our, at our pie chart, look at the, uh, the markup that's actually powering it, uh, we have this div uh, element that has a, an SVG. The SVG has a width and a height. Um, then we have a G inside that that's been translated so that it's centered inside the SVG. You'll notice that the, the 180 is half the, uh, the width and height. And then we have these four path elements that uh, correspond to the four segments of the pi. Um, so this is the data set that we're using. It's just a, I just made up some data. Um, don't worry too much about that. But the, the key thing to note is that each object has a label and a count. And we're going to be making use of that as we go along. Um, so time to get to the code. First thing we're going to do is just define a few dimensions, width, height, and then the radius we're just going to set to the, the smaller of those two divided by two. so that it fills the uh, short, smallest dimension. OK, so now we actually get into some D3. Um, the top one is the one that, that I'm going to be using. Um, D3 has a bunch of color scales that are built in, uh, category 10, category 20A, 20B, 20C. Um, and it basically just defines an array of, of 10 or 20 colors that uh, when you're doing something like a pie chart, it will use those colors up. And if it gets to the end and there's still more data points to to display, then it will start over at the beginning. You can also just, just, just um, define your own colors if you want. Um, so let's take a look at the, how we create that SVG um, using D3. So I mean, at first glance, it looks like a lot of lines here. But if we look at it just line by line, it's really not that bad, especially if we compare it to what what is actually happening. So the first line in, D th in our example here, actually, let me go back maybe and zoom in a little bit here. Oops. Wrong thing. Anyways, um, go for it here. So we're selecting the chart, which is a lot like if you've used jQuery or anything, this is going to look very similar. Uh, we select an element using a query selector. Then we append an SVG to it which you can see at the top is exactly what we're seeing in the markup. Then we set the width and the height, add a G element to that, and translate it so it's centered. So 
you can see that the, uh, the D3 code matches almost exactly, well, exactly to what we see above, minus the path elements. So that's what remains. We have to add our path elements. And for that, we need two things. Um, because it's a pie, uh, it's round, and we need a radius, and we need to define the angles. So the radius, we already set the value for that earlier. We have to tell D3 about it. And we do that using its, uh, the SVG arc method. And we just say outer radius is the radius that we defined earlier. So that's straightforward enough. Um, for the pi, for, sorry, for the angles, uh, we're going to use D3's layout.pi. Um, you, could you could make a pie chart without using this layout.pi. You could just use the arc. Um, but this is a, a convenience method to make it easier to uh, calculate the, the values and extract it from the from your data set. So uh, we have to tell it how to get the, the content out of our data set. And that's what the second line does, where D in this case, where we have value function D, D is the, the, uh, the current element in the data set as it's iterating through it. And we tell it that to use the count property of that uh, data point to calculate the angles. The last line, sort null, um, at this stage, we don't really need that, but what, what that does is prevent it from sorting anything. If you don't want it to sort the data set, then you tell it sort null. Otherwise, it will sort in descending order. Um, and while that's not important right now, it will be important later on, and it will be particularly important when we start animating things, because if you don't uh, turn off sorting, your animation looks really kind of wonky, because it changes the order of things as you remove elements. Um, all right, so now for the, the fun bit. That was all just kind of laying the groundwork. Now this is the real meat of the thing, and this is, this is the thing that I want you to take away from today, if, if nothing else, is this bit right here. Now this might look a little cryptic, I admit, um, but we're gonna look at it line by line to see what's happening, uh, because it's not as hard as it looks. It's, uh, it's actually, there's no magic to it at all. Again, we're seeing this select all. So we're selecting all the path elements, because remember, what we're trying to do at this point is add those four path uh, elements to our, to our SVG. Uh, we're selecting, they don't exist yet, that doesn't matter. We're, we're, we start off by selecting them. We tell it about our data set by calling the dot data on it, and we pass in the pi version of our data set. Uh, Enter creates placeholder nodes for each point in the data set, because at this point they don't exist. Um, well, specifically it creates ones, it creates nodes for, or it creates any nodes that don't exist yet. And then we replace those nodes with the path elements by calling dot append on this. Now, uh, at that point we have our elements in there, we just have to tell it uh, what the properties of this path are. So the first thing we do is assign the arc to the D attribute. Uh, D is something you'll see in, in um, is an attribute you see in SVG that defines uh, the, how the arc is shaped. And finally, uh, the fill is uh, the background color, essentially. That's what fill is. It's, if you were thinking of it in CSS terms, fill means background color. And in this case, we uh, are passing in our labels into our, the color function. And so when D3 iterates over this, uh, over our data set, um, it gives first the data point and then an index uh, to the point in the array that we're at. And so we can access both of those within this, uh, this callback. Now, this pattern, select all, data, enter, append, I, I know it seems a little bit cryptic, but it comes up again and again in D3 examples. If, and we're actually gonna see it again a second time in this, in this talk. Uh, it comes up all the time. Not every chart type uses it, but it comes up in a lot of, a lot of the examples you're gonna look at. And recognizing it can really help orient you in a, in a when you're looking at someone else's <coughs> D3 code for the first time, this can act kind of like a lodestone to, to, uh, to tell you where, where things are happening. Because this is where 
this is where the important stuff happens. So we have our pie chart at this point, but we're going to switch it into a donut chart. And basically, we want to cut a hole in it. Now, how do we do that? Uh, you may think that it's going to be tricky. I mean, we've already had quite a bit of code to get as far as we have. But um, D3 actually makes this very easy. Uh, first, we'll just define a width. We're going to have a 75 pixel wide, wide donut. And then on our arc function, where previously we were just defining the outer radius, now we're going to define our inner radius. And we're just setting it to be uh, the donut width less than the radius. So what this is going to mean is that so starting from center, it goes out with nothing until it gets to the inner radius. And then it has, uh, then it has the chart until it hits the outer radius. Uh, inner radius is by default 0, which is why if you don't define it, you get a circle. Um, but once you do define it, you end up with an annulus. So that's all we have to do, actually. That's, uh, that's it. Um, easy mode. Uh, now for something a little trickier, though, uh, the legend is going to take a little more work than the donut. So because if we don't have a legend, we can't tell what the colors mean, right? That, that there's no no meaning to our, to our, to our graph. So uh, we want to do this. And if we look at the DOM for, so each, each uh, entry in the legend has a rectangle and a text. So if we look at what that looks like, we see, again, we have more G elements. Each one has a class legend and has been translated to, uh, to a certain point on relative to the center of the, of the donut. And then inside that, we have a rect, which is the square. So it's got a width, height, and uh, the fill and the stroke. Fill is the background color, and stroke is like the border. Uh, I've truncated what, what is in there just to make it fit on the slide. And then the text has an x and y, uh, has x and y attributes. And those position it relative to the parent, which is the g in this case. So uh, if we look back at this, the very first thing we did when we set up our SVG was add that G element that we centered right in the middle. So everything that we're doing now is relative to that center point. Uh, so uh, these uh, rectangles and text that we see here have been translated. Well, in this case, this is the first one. So the translation is negative 36, negative 44. We're not going to worry too much about how those numbers came about. But um, if we notice we haven't actually had to use any CSS yet, um, which is, in my opinion, a good thing. Um, CSS is uh, a little bit painful at times. So, but we can't avoid it forever. Um, so we're going to define a font size for our legend just to keep it standardized. And we're going to set the border on the rectangles. Now, right now, we don't need that because the border and the the background of the same color, we can't tell the difference. But later on, when we animate it, or when we have the, the click handler on the rectangle so that we can filter, uh, we want the, the fill to go away and the border to stay. So we're just going to define this now and get it out of the way. Um, this is for just defining the size. The legend rect size is 18 pixels. That's how big the rectangles are. The spacing is just used to, um, to uh, you know, make sure that, nothing's are, that nothing is right next to each other. So we're going to use this pattern again to add the legend. Uh, like I said, we're going to see, you'll see this a lot when you're working with D3. And what it looks like here, it's a little different here than it was before, but it's almost, it's the same general idea. I know that red's a little hard to see on there, sorry. Um, so we start by selecting all, the, all elements with class legend inside the SVG. And again, those don't exist yet, but we're going to create them with the, with the enter method. Uh, and our color domain at this point is actually the, the list or the set of labels from our, from our objects. Remember, each, each object that we started out with in our data set had a label and a count. And when we defined our, uh, when we first defined the pie chart, we uh, passed the labels into the color. Um, function that we created earlier. And so at this point, the color domain is this, the, 
the array of labels that we have on hand. And we're going to, that's how we're going to be able to add the text. But first, uh, we have to create, use enter to create the placeholder nodes and then append the G elements that, uh, if we, uh, let's just pop back here for a second. Here we are. Um, so we have a G element with class legend. It's been translated. And that's all we're doing here is um, adding those G elements, giving them a class legend, and then we're going to uh, move them so that they are properly centered. We're not going to worry too much about how this is done because it's not really important. But uh, essentially, this, what this means is that because of the way this has been calculated, it's not specific to the data set that we're using. If I swap out the data set, which I'm going to be doing shortly, then uh, this, the uh, legend will transform or adjust itself accordingly without me having to do any more math. So I take care of all the math here. Uh, and all I'm doing is using the, in the callback to, to the uh, adder function or method, we see that I have a D and an I as the parameters. And as I mentioned earlier, the D is the current data point as I iterate through the data set. And the second one, the I, is the index. And so I'm making use of that index uh, on the second to last line where I say vert equals I times height minus offset. So I'm using how many points are in the data set to determine how high to start my legend and then how much to adjust each element as I go down through the list. But this isn't particularly pertinent to this example. Um, so now we have the container, the, the the, the legend, the G attributes, but we have to add the colored rectangle and we have to add the text. So this is how we add the rectangle. Again, very similar to what you might do with jQuery. Um, we have a reference to legend, which is the G element. And we just append a rect element to that. And so at this point, we have a reference to, to the rect element. Um, and so we add our width and height attributes. And then we just define the uh, the fill and the, the stroke. Um, now, I, I mentioned that the, uh, the color domain is the set of labels. And so at this point, um, notice how I passed the color, just color into the last two. Um, color at this point, if I pass it in a label from my, uh, from my data set, it will return the color that corresponds to that label. So if I pass in Beetlejuice, it's going to give me Hashtag, or hashtag, <laughs> uh, whatever, Octothorpe, uh, 3F123C or something like that. Uh, and again, we're going to make use of the labels here when we append the text uh, in the last line. Well, first, again, I, I take the legend and I add the text elements. I set the, the x and y uh, coordinates. and um, these don't have to know anything about where I am in the, the array because they're positioned relative to their container. So that's why I can just have the same um, X and Y calculation for, for all of these. And then finally, uh, for the text, I just have this identity function that uh, because my Ds, of my data for the legend is just the set of labels, I don't have to do anything at this point. But I could, for, for instance, if, if I wanted all my labels to be all uppercase, then instead of return D in the last line, I could have return D dot to uppercase, or I could do whatever I wanted. I could turn all the E's into threes, or, you know. Um, but in our case, we're just returning it as is. So uh, that brings us to the end of our legend. Next we're going to want to load some external data. Because normally, when you're working with something like D3, uh, you don't want to have to code all the, the, your data into your JavaScript file. Because sometimes you're working with you know, hundreds of th or thousands of data points. So we need to be able to get access to external files. And, and also, our data set at this point is a little bit silly. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so we want something a little more realistic. And so what we're going to actually use is the uh, Toronto parking ticket data set. Uh, this is part of the open data um, 
initiative uh, that Toronto has. Uh, so this is, they have a pile of information about the, uh, the parking tickets, including the type of infraction, the date, the time, the location, and uh, where it happened. And uh, there's a repo that goes along with this presentation. Um, you can find the links to it in the, the blog posts. And um, <laughs> I love that. Uh, and uh, the, the we, we're going to use the weekdays, the number of tickets uh, given on each day of the week. That information is not directly in that data set. I used a, a pandas in an IPython notebook to to transform the data set a bit and get these values out. And the, the IPON, uh, IPython notebook is, is also in the, in the repo. This is what happens when you run that on the 2012 data set. These are the numbers that we get out for Monday through Sunday. And so this is, this is a CSV file that we're going to be using. And you'll notice that the first row is the, the, the column names, the label and the count, which luckily enough correspond exactly with our dummy data, so we're, we're going to be able to swap these out without changing any of the code that we've already written. Everything that refers to counts and labels will just continue to work. And in fact, we could swap in any uh, data set that had label and count um, uh, fields, and it would work fine. It, the only issue would be if you had too many data points, it would extend outside the, the range of our donut hole. So uh, to, do, to read this in, we're well, sorry, first, this is what it's going to look like. So whereas before we just had the four data points, now we have the seven. And you'll notice that the legend has adjusted itself accordingly, so it fits nicely in the middle. So D3 provides a number of uh, helper functions for reading in common data formats. We're going to make use of the D3.csv here. And all you need to do with it is give it the, the path, the URL to the uh, to the, to the file. In this case, it's just in the same directory, so that's fine. And then the, um, the callback, because this is an asynchronous operation, so um, the callback will, well, there's an error if there's something goes wrong, and then it gives you the, the data set that it, that it retrieved. And because it's async, we have to put all the code that depends on the data set inside the callback. So some of our some of the stuff we define, like when we define the arc and we define the color and we define the, sorry? Oh, sorry, I'm hearing things apparently. Um, and we define the pi, those didn't make any reference to the data. So they can be outside this callback. But when we define the path and we define the legend, all of those had specific references to the data set. So we have to put them inside this callback. And it also has TSV and DSV methods uh, for tab separated and, and just, the DSV is for arbitrary delimited files. So if you had pipe separated or whatever, you can make use of the DSV one. Uh, now, there's one more thing we have to do when we read in this data, uh, and that, oh, first I should, actually I should mention this first, is that uh, if we look back at the data set here, so we have label count and then these, uh, uh, the values, by default, D3 assumes that the first line is going to define the, co the column names. And then it uses those to create uh, the, the keys for the key value pairs on the object that it returns. So just like our original data set was an array of objects, and each object had a label and a count, that's, we're going to get the exact same thing out of this, uh, out of this call. Um, it's going to transform this into a very similar data set. It's, only, it's just it's going to have seven elements instead of four. However, it doesn't know what our data types are. It just reads in everything in, in as a string. So we have to do one thing, and that is cast all the counts to numbers, because we need them to be numbers so we can calculate the, the angles. And this is just the fastest way to do that. Um, we just do a for each on the data set as soon as we get it. This is the very first thing that happens inside the callback. Go over it and cast all the counts to numbers, and then we can proceed. Uh, as before. And that's it. That's all you have to do for, um, for reading in external files. We only had to wrap anything that was dependent on the data set inside the callback to the CSV uh, method and then make sure that numerical fields were properly turned into numbers. So 
at this point, uh, you may have noticed that the uh, our pie chart, the, the numbers are all very similar. So it's hard to tell how big or which of the days are bigger than others. And that's actually relates back to the issue with pie charts. As humans, uh, we have a harder time uh, comparing by angle than we do comparing by length. So uh, we're going to add tool to file. Oh, that's too big. There we go. Um, can you see that all right? Like when I hover over these, these sections, there's a tooltip that appears in the center that tells me the weekday, the total count, and it gives me a percentage of the total. So we can see that Monday's 13.8 and Sunday's only 10.3 of the total. Whereas I think Thursday was wrong. Wednesday, Thursday. Pardon me, Wednesday's pretty big with 15.7. All right. So again, we're going to need a little bit of CSS. Uh, the, our SVG is inside a div with the ID chart. So we're, our, we're just going to position this tooltip um, relative, relative to the chart itself. So we're going to put a uh, position relative on that, and we're just going to set it the same width and height as the SVG itself. Then this is the CSS that I've put together for the tooltip. Um, it's nothing too important here, but uh, the one thing that's worth noting is the, um, because I'm sticking it right in the center of the donut, um, the top and the left values are specific to this, um, this donut. Uh, given the, the, the sizes that we've decided on. If you were doing this in some sort of more scalable way, uh, or if, like a responsive way or something, you might have other ways of doing that. Um, but we don't need to worry about this too much. Uh, this is more important. We're going to create the tooltip. And it, uh, we're just using divs for this. And we're going to have a single div uh, with the class tooltip. And inside it, we're going to have three more divs, one with the class label, one with the class count, and one with the class percent. And so this is, again, very similar to what you would see with something like jQuery. Uh, we're just appending these divs, well, for appending the first one to the chart, and then appending the later ones to the, to the one we appended to the chart. And this code doesn't depend on the data set. So we can have it outside of our callback. We can define it earlier on if we want. But for it to actually do anything, we have to listen for mouse events. And if you want to add any kind of interactivity into your um, D3 chart, then you're going to have to use most events in some form or another. So uh, we're going to be attaching them to the, the path elements, which are the, the segments of the pie. Uh, we're going to have a mouse over and a mouse out. So for mouse over, uh, we're going to, well, we're calculating the percentage here to start with. This, I mean, you, you're probably thinking to yourself that the calculation of the total doesn't need to be done on every mouse over. You could be doing this when you get the data set for the first time, for example. That would be a lot more efficient. However, um, later on, we're going to be changing the values, and we want the percentages to be the percentage of the remaining elements that are being displayed as opposed to all of them. So this, will, this makes it more dynamic in that sense. So uh, D3 has some nice helper methods to deal with arrays, such as the sum. So I'm using d3.sum here, uh, and I'm passing into that just the, I'm just creating an array of the counts and passing that into d3.sum to get the total. Uh, then I calculate percent, and then I just find the label count and percent uh, divs inside my current tooltip, or sorry, inside my tooltip, and uh, putting in the data that corresponds to those. And finally, I make it so you can actually see it, so it's displayed a block. But if we just had this one, the tooltip would show up and never go away. So we want a mouse out. All it has to do is, is make the, the tooltip disappear, display none. Now, in this case, the tooltip isn't moving. So if you wanted the tooltip to follow the mouse around, um, then you could optionally add a mouse move uh, listener. And for that, you can tap into D3's uh, event object, and so what I'm doing here is when the mouse, when mouse move fires, I'm moving the tooltip to be uh, 10 pixels to the right and 10 pixels below the current position of the cursor. So d3.event.pageY and .pageX give you where the, where the, where, where the event happened. 
And if you do that, then the mouse, or the, sorry, the tooltip will follow the mouse around until you leave the, one of the pie segments, and then it will just stop dead and disappear, um, like this poor little dog. All right, so that is our tooltips. Now we get to the, the big one. Um, we want to be able to filter our data set, and when we filter it, we want the change to be animated. And so we saw this earlier, but I'll just show you again. So if I wanted to just look at weekdays, I can remove these two days, and it adjusts. And you'll notice that the earlier Wednesday was 15.7. Uh, now it's 20.6. And if I removed everything but Monday, it should say 100 if I did the math right. OK, good, 100%. Um, you'll notice I can't get rid of Monday. No matter how many times I click on that, it's not going to let me get rid of it because uh, what's a chart with no, no data points? So um, you'll, uh, we'll see how, how that's done. Um, all right. So the thing is, animation is hard. And it's, it, if, I mean, I'm sure many of you have tried to do um, animations with JavaScript before. And the nice thing is that D3 makes this quite easy for us. Uh, there's more patterns, just like we had that select all um, data enter append pattern, there are patterns that come up when you're dealing with animation. First, though, we, we need a little more CSS because we want the, the box, when we click on it, we want it to go white inside and just the border to remain. And we also want it to have a you know, the pointer cursor on it so people know to click on it. That's all this is doing. Uh, now, there's a few things we've got to add to our existing code. To, uh, to enable all this. So the first thing we're going to do is when we first get our data set and we are iterating through it to cast those things to numbers, we're going to add a property called enabled. And uh, this is going to let us know whether or not the, that particular data point is, should be shown in the, uh, in the chart or not. Next. Uh, this is specifically for the animation. If you're looking at examples of um, D3 examples where animation is, is, is concerned, you'll often see this underscore current kicking around. And it's, uh, it's used to enable the smooth transition. We'll see the, how this is actually used in a minute. But what I'm doing is appending it to our path, which is the, the path, just as a reminder, refers to the, the segments. And I'm just storing what its data point. For each path, I'm storing its current or initial data point on this doc, or underscore current. And then we also have to change our calculation so that we get the proper percentage. Um, as I said, we, we don't want the total to be the entire total. We want to be the number based on which elements are currently enabled. And that's what this does. We're just uh, Instead of just returning d.count, which is what this did before, it checks the enabled property and then only returns count or zero, depending on what that, whether that's turned on or not. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Now we get to the really important part. Um, this is a click, uh, click interaction. So we're going to add the click listener to to the rectangles. So this, the, the top part here, you can see where, where I've labeled it new. That's, that's the new code. The, the stuff above that was all there before. Um, we're just adding one more thing to it. And the, the nice thing about D3 is that everything, you can change. It's very, very chain driven. You always, everything's always chained together. So um, you'll see this, this style a lot. So what actually goes inside this callback? You'll notice that. When I click on it, when I click on the, the label, or sorry, when I click on the rectangle, because the legend has, the data set for the legend is the set of labels, it will pass in to this callback the current, the, the label corresponding to the one that I clicked on. And we're going to make use of that in a, in a minute. So what do we have inside this function? OK, so the first thing we're doing here is, uh, setting rect to be the, the D3's version of, of the current rectangle. This is just so that we have access to some nicer 
uh, methods for accessing data. Um, we're going to start by just assuming that, that it's enabled and we'll possibly change that down the road. Then uh, this next line, the total enabled, this is, re do you remember how when I was clicking on the days of the week and I was down to Monday and I kept clicking on Monday and it wouldn't go away, that was because I had figured out how many were already disabled and I'm going to prevent people from disabling them all. So I'm just counting up uh, how many are currently enabled. Then this next bit, I'm using the class disabled to, to tell whether or not the rectangle is disabled. In the CS, if we pop back to the CSS for a second, uh, the second one, that's when I'm getting rid of the background color is when it has a uh, class disabled on it. So uh, if it's currently disabled and I click on it, then uh, it, we can enable it, that's fine. Uh, but if, I, if it's currently enabled and I click on it, the first thing we're gonna do is check that total enabled number that I uh, calculated before just to make sure that they're not trying to break something. They're not trying to get rid of all the data points. If they are, then we just exit out of here and, and they can click to their heart's content. But assuming there's still some, assuming that we can disable it, we disable it and set enabled to false. Um, this is where the real, the real magic happens. So because we're, when you enable or disable a data point, the pie chart has to update. The angles have to change. Um, the radius is, isn't moving, it's, it's the same as it was before, but the angles are all gonna have to adjust. And so we have to change the way that, the, that our pi function um, accesses the data. And so originally when we had this pi dot value, we just returned d dot count. But now we're only gonna return d dot count if it's enabled, otherwise we're gonna return zero. Um, we're also taking this opportunity in the first, the, the first if there um, to, to set that. And that's, this is where that label that got passed in, if we look back here, uh, the on click function label, that label is the, the label of the legend item that was just clicked. So I can use that to set the enabled property of the data point. And once I've updated the pi, then I can update the, the segments by uh, passing the new pi into the path.data. And then we get to the transition. So for the transition, um, I've set a, tr a duration of um, 750 milliseconds on it. And the, the next bit is the important one, the adder tween. So this means that it's, it's adder, in this case, is attribute. And it's the first thing, the d that we're passing into this, adder tween d. d means that we're accessing the d attribute of the path. And you'll see a lot of Ds kicking around when you're looking at D3. I, maybe that's why he called it D3, I don't know. But um, because the D in the function is not the same D. And that gets a little confusing, I know. Uh, but this is how you'll often see the code in the wild, so that's why I kept it this way. Um, the, the trick is just to remember that, that not all Ds are the same D. Uh, so the first D is just telling it that we're changing the D attribute, and then the second D is the current data point, okay. So uh, D3 has this interpolate um, method, and this is where that underscore current comes into, comes into play. So we're gonna interpolate between the current position and the new one, the new one being D, and the current one being underscore current. And once we've set up that interpolate variable, we can, I should mention the, uh, var interpolate equals d3 blah blah blah. You'll often see that as just var i equals d3 dot interpolate. Um, if you're seeing that the i doesn't mean index, it means interpolate. Uh, and then we just update the current once we've used it. And then we, this is where the, the actual animation happens is in this final step here. Um, so we're updating the arc with the interpolation, with the interpolation that we're trying to achieve. And so, do I have, that's back, where is it here? So that's why when I click on these things, there's this nice smooth transition. So um, that is how we add that. 
And that is it. We're done. Um, so that was a lot of code, I know. You're probably all coded out at this point. Um, but I'm, hopefully um, you've seen that while there's a lot of code, each thing is very specific. With D3, it's, it's like, um, well, each method that you're calling has one job, and it does that job very well. And uh, so you, because each one has a specific job, you have a lot of them to call. But it, that's what makes it so flexible, is because you can chain and compose these things in so many different ways. And out of that flexibility is where D3's power really comes. Um, Mike, the guy that created um, D3, ha had a popular post recently um, that was called, uh, what was it? It was like visualizing algorithms. Some of you may have seen that kicking around on Hacker News or whatever. Um, and he used D3 for that, obviously, um, looking at you know, visualizing quicksort and that kind of thing. So it's not just for bar charts and that kind of thing. You can do a lot with D3. All right. So um, thank you. Uh, the deck is up there. Like I said, uh, my, my site has blog posts related to this that go into to more detail. And you don't have to take it all in quite so quickly. Um, there's six or seven posts that kind of cover this material. And that is it. <laughs>